Welcome, everybody. Welcome to an amazing class tonight. I am very, very happy to be back from the land of Israel, from Eretz Yisrael. And um, for those that were following along the journey uh, with me on social media, um, really what you guys got to see was maybe, I don't know, 5% of what was really going on in Eretz Yisrael. But um, I was so um, inspired and moved and completely on a different plane uh, than I've been in a while that the funny part about it is, is that as, as you guys know, we were going through the class of the life of a breast lover and we've been going in order, right? So really what, what's supposed to be tonight's class, since the last class we did was called preparing to pray. That was the last class that we did. The next line item of the life of a breast lover is the Shachari prayer. And we're supposed to learn about the Shachari prayer and different things that Rabbi Nachman talks about and we're going to learn in depth. And I got back from Eretz Yisrael and I looked at my life of a breast lover and I see the last one, number 27. There's 27 line items of what a life of a breast lover is supposed to be like. And number 27 deals specifically with the land of Israel. So I said, you know what, let's just cut to the chase. <laughs> I'm like feeling like a high from Eretz Yisrael right now. And I'm like, let's let's go there. Let's let's dig deep into Eretz Yisrael a little bit. And then when I started doing that process and really looking at, at what we can discuss in general, I realized this is not going to be a one-off class. This is mo for sure going to be a two-off class, maybe even three classes on Eretz Yisrael. Because there's so much to talk about. And it's such an important and, 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 and integral part of, of of life for a Jew, for sure, obviously, and and what Eretz Israel represents and what it is. So I think tonight what we're going to do, as you're going to see, is um, we're going to learn. We're going to go back first of all, a little bit of history. I think it's important that we go back to history. And I'm not talking about history. When it's in history. I'm not talking about the modern state of Israel. And I'm not talking about any of that. When I talk about Eretz Israel. All that part of history is, is a beautiful thing. It's very nice. I'm more interested and I'm more focused on the spiritual aspect of Israel, okay? As we're gonna see right now. So with that being said, for those that are here are watching online, I'll share my screen with you. For those that are actually here following on this Facebook account, you're more than welcome to go to the Lighthouse Torah project page. You can watch the class with the text or you can join on Zoom click on a previous link of mine in the timeline and you'll find the Zoom link. Now, what does Rabbi Itzchak Breiter, who wrote The Life of a Breast Lover, oh wait, one more thing before we start, I just want to say one more thing. Uman Rosh Hashanah, plans are beginning. This is, a, uh -oh. this is a, a shout out to all my, really for all the men out there, that the time is now crunch time, starting to start thinking, start planning, Rosh Hashanah is around the corner. It's only, what, a couple months away, two months away, two and a half months away, which means it's really here. And I'm literally, as we speak, we're already now looking at tickets, getting our place to stay. Anybody who's watching this now or wants to ask me later, where do we stay? How do you go red carpet with me and, and, and my posse? Feel free to reach out to me. I'll hook you guys up. And, uh, and again, I'll make sure you have an incredible time in Uman and feel an incredible amount of light. That's what Rabbeinu talks about. So. Just wanted to throw that in there. Okay. What does Itzhak Breiter say? Let's look at the first thing. Everybody look at the first page. We have it here in front of you for all the users online. Here you go. And here we go. What does he say? He says like this. Line nine number 27, Eretz Yisrael. Every day of his life, a person's life, you should yearn, pray, and make practical steps to live in Eretz Yisrael, or at the very least, to walk four steps there. Through this, one merits increased patience. And when I read that, I think it's so funny at the same time, because like when you go to Israel, what's one of the first things that you're going to need? Patience. Patience. Yeah. Sablanut. Right. And I was very conscious of that. I mean, I mean, I know this stuff. I read this stuff and I get there and I'm like, are you already? It's like things are coming at you fast. And, you know, you have to learn how to breathe in, you know, and learn how to deal and roll with the punches because it's a tough place, right? People are not playing games there. So, so again, when you get there, you merit to increase patience and gives you the ability to advance 
from level to level and to draw upon himself comprehensive holiness. What does it mean to go from level to level? We're talking about spirituality, that when a person is in Eretz Yisrael, you game up on yourself. If you're there for the visit, you will game up. You will go a higher level of spirituality. That's a goal that you should have when you're there, especially if you live there. It's a constant going up, going up, and going up. And that's what Eretz Yisrael provides for a person. Okay? This is the essence of a person's holy victory in this world, which I'll bring that passage back at the end. Rabbi Nachman talks about it. The idea of winning in this world, the battle begins when you're already not in Eretz Yisrael. And then when you're in Eretz Yisrael, the battle is even stronger, so to speak, as we're going to see. Fine. Now, with that being said, we got to go back in history. When is the first time that we see in the Torah mentioning of Eretz Yisrael? And the answer is the yeah. first Pasuk in Breshit. Where is it? I have it there for you guys. Breshit bara Elohim. What does that mean? God created the world, right? He created the world. And how did he create the world? With the heavens and the earth. So if you look at the Rashi, Rashi, the main, main commentator of Kumash, and he looks at that Pasuk, and what does he say on that first Pasuk? Why does the Torah begin with the story of creation? You can see it right there. If the nations say, you guys are thieves, you guys stole our land. Does that sound familiar, by the way? <clears throat> Tell them that God created the entire world and it, be and it belongs to him. So he can do whatever he wants. He's going to give it to the nations of the land. He can give it, to, but he can take it from them and give it to us. The first Hasuk embration in the beginning of the Torah literally is to tell people that God can give the land to Eretz Yisrael to whoever he wants. And in this case, he gave it to us. So if you're in the United Nations and I'm the prime minister of Eretz Yisrael and I say, but Rashi said, <laughs> Rashi said that this is the reason why Eretz Yisrael belongs to Jewish people because Rashi said that in Breshi Bar Elokim. What are they going to do? They're going to laugh in your face. Do you know why Rashi put that in there? That message is not for the other nations. Look at it. Rab Nassim of Breslov, Rabbi Nachman's main student. Look what he says on that pasuk. Beautiful. So important because people think, oh, but this is what to show the world. Da, 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 da. Look what he says. Rab Nassim asked, what is Rashi trying to tell us? And he says that Rashi is addressing not the world, not the United Nations. He's addressing us, the Jewish people, not the Gentiles. It's due to our lack of emunah, our lack of faith. We don't have enough faith that we can claim to the land. Verbal and physical attacks on Jews may be answered only by our faith in God. We, have to, we must reply to all our enemies that we believe that God created the world and it belongs to him. And if we, and if we, it comes to us, and if we believe, if we have emunah in Hashem, we, that will convince the other nations of the world about the truth of our claim. And they will eventually accept the premise that God created the world and that he gave it to the land of Israel. That's from Likutei Chalachot, Shomer Sachar. You could see Rav Nassan is very clear. He's making a very strong point that from the beginning of Breshi, that first Pasuk, it's about us. It's to convince us. It's for us to have faith in Eretz Yisrael. It's not to second guess it. Oh, we need to give land to the past. Like, it's our land. Like, have faith in what the Torah says. Period. Big, strong statement. Cool? Now, I put this puzzle again because it's now we're going to go into like a little bit of a similar territory. And it's going to, you see how it's going to be an equation. Emuna, faith in Hashem, is connected to Eretz Yisrael. Okay? Here's a passage from Tehillim, David HaMelech. Betach Hashem, trust in the Lord, that's set up and do good. And here's the kicker of the passage. Shchan Eretz Ure'emuna. Live in the land. What land are we talking about? Eretz Yisrael. Ure'emuna. Here it says, and remain loyal. Ure'e really means, and Literally, you could see, you can invigorate yourself. You push your whole self. You're, you are in Muna. And it's so true because when a person's living in the land of Eretz Yisrael, things don't work the same way 
like Kutzla Aritz, like in America. It's a land of miracles, okay? If you really want to and really put yourself and connect on that level, right? Your whole life in Eretz Yisrael is, pure, is all about faith and Muna and miracles and some things don't even make sense. I walk, I'll give you an example, even though it's not the same idea, but it is. Divine providence happens all the time when you're in Israel, okay? One of my, rab, my main, main Rabbanim, right? His name is Rav Chaim Kramer. He's the one who runs the Brussels Thank Research you. Institute, okay? I had, in my mind, I'm like, maybe when I get back, I, I was, I got to Israel, I went to Efrat, Maracha Machpelah, and then we spent a couple of days in Efrat, and then I was going to go to Tiberias, uh, Tzfat, and then I was going to go back to Yushalayim, that's around day five. And I'm like, oh, but day five, day six, I'll go and I'll visit my rabbi. Okay, that was my plan. I didn't call, I didn't do anything. Literally, the first day that I got there, we went to Maracha Machpelah, at a bar mitzvah, the next day, I went to Kever Rachel, to the, to the grave of Rachel Imenu. I literally am walking in. This is like I'm two hours before Shabbat. I walk into the building. Rav Chaim Kramer is coming out. And he doesn't even live there. He lives in Yushalayim. Like, he's my, this is like, like, what are the chances? Had I gone? Had I missed something else? Would I have, there was a lot of things that happened in between that day that could have changed, right? So, if you want, you can want to get some chairs, extra chairs. So the point is that that all these interesting things happen all the time, but emunah and faith in Hashem is so strong in Eretz Yisrael. Now, let's continue on with the story. So now we we finish with this idea from Breshi. When is the next time that we actually see the conversation of Eretz Yisrael? We know that God reaches out to Avram, Abraham. Yes? What does he say? He says to Abraham, go to the land that I'm going to show you. <laughs> I know, because he used to be called Abraham. I will make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you great. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. So we see that Abraham, who is really the first, first person ever that actually gets directions, there's a land, there's a land called Eretz Canaan, there's a land that's going to be for your people, for your heritage. It's going to come through you, and you're going to be in this land. Okay. Now, what do we see from that? In the next page. Notice one thing. God tells him, you're going to go to a specific land. Does Abraham know where the land is? No. He has no idea where he's going, right? It's kind of, kind of like, I, I can't imagine the idea, but you're going to go to this land and like, that's going to be your land. And he has no clue what's going on, right? So it's, also, it's very interesting to understand that God says, it's the land that I'm going to show you, which is very personal. That's number one. As a, as a message, look at the words because it's important. I'm going to show you what it is. Now, what does the Zohar say on this? Fascinating. He says, every single land in the world Every let's call it every country in the world has a guardian angel, every single one. Okay, so when God tells Abraham, "Go to the land that I'm going to show you," Abraham is on a very high level spiritually. Okay, and he's looking and considering every attribute, every land. Like, which land am I going to go to? And he's actually thinking about, well, that angel is in charge of that country and that country, and like, and he's trying to understand what is he talking about. And he couldn't understand what land God is talking to him about. He's really high up there spiritually. He's trying to understand where am I going? What's that land? I know that all the angels run this, but he doesn't understand that. And what he didn't realize is that the land of Eretz Yisrael is not overseen by angels. It's only overseen by Hashem. Hashem is the only, so to speak, control over the land of Israel. There's his eyes on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, which is amazing. Think about that for a second. Think about all the, everywhere in the world. Yeah, okay, they have like a ministering angel overlooking this place, even in America, yeah? But in Israel, it's just Hashem running the show, period, which is amazing. Continues with the story. What happens next? Then God makes a covenant with Abraham. He makes a, 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 a pact. Compromiso, right? Is that what we say in Spanish? Compromiso? Okay, what was the class that was in Espanol? No, no. Relax. So it, yeah, relax, relax. <laughs> okay, and then he says, look at the postdoc in Brashid. He says, 
again, to your descendants, to your family that's going to come down, I'm going to give you this land. Beautiful. Okay, we're going through history right now, just understanding where does Eretz Yisrael come from. Now, you continue on. You can see, actually, I'm going to put a little cute map here. This is exactly what Israel used to look like with all the different nations that were living in it, in it right? We read about this every single day. Right, by Baruch David in the prayer in the Shachari, we say these nations that God gave this land from these nations and He gave it to us. Okay, you can see where they're all located all around the area. Okay, that's it. The what? Oh, yeah, sorry guys. Here we go. Here we go for you guys online. Here you go. Beautiful picture. Okay, now with that being said, you can see that there were these 10 nations. Okay, and these nations, these ones right there, they all were on the area west of the Jordan River. There were three nations that were on the east, and there were seven on the west. And now this is very important. God seals his covenant with Abraham, right? And he makes his promise, and he says that through the commandment of circumcision, which is a big deal, guys. So he tells Abraham, you have to circumcise yourselves. As we know, that's called the covenant. God says, guard my covenant. I'm going to be your Lord and the God of your descendants. I'm going to give you and your descendants the land that you dwell in, the whole land of Canaan, for an eternal heritage. Meaning, this is huge, if he accepts the mitzvah of circumcision, Abraham gets the land. That's what Rashi says. What does that mean? That's why it's called, in figurative, it's called the promised land. Why is it called the promised land? Promise is a covenant. It's an agreement. You do this, I do this. That's why it's called the promised land. Yeah? And that whole thing began from Abraham's emunah and faith in Hashem. This is real. I'm not some crazy person. I am literally talking to Hashem. Hashem runs the whole world. He's the first person who figures it out. Okay? So, now Abraham has a pact. The circumcision. What does the circumcision rep represent? It represents Kedusha, as we're going to learn a little bit more about that concept of what the circumcision really means. Now, super interesting. Take a look at this. Let's go back to Noah's flood. Okay? Noah had three sons. Okay? When the flood happened and eventually they landed, everybody dispersed, right? And we know that the population started going out. The descendants, one of the descendants of, of Noah was his name was Ham. Okay. Ham, in regards to Ham's family, one of his other children was Canaan. Okay. So certain parts of Canaan, some people went to Egypt, some were in Ethiopia, Transjordan, Lebanon, Syria, and also the land of Israel. That's where they inhabited. So we see that Ham, the son of Noah, their people went there. But, as you're going to also learn later on, that Abraham comes from Shem. Shem is Noah's also son. And we learn in the Midrash, as we're going to see it again later on, that Shem had, through Malkitzedek, which is one of the main kings, he had control. He was given over the land of Yerushalayim. So really, Abraham came back to reconquer the land that was already supposed to be given to his people. But Ham, which represents Canaan, which represents not so nice, as we're going to see, they were the ones that came in the beginning and took it over. And we're going to see right now, we're going to talk about it. And again, just to continue as we're going through the story, right? Now, these 10 tribes, the Canaanites, Canaanites, Canmonites, you can look at the map, you can see where they are. They live southeast of the Jordan River. And on the other side, you have the seven tribes, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Gagashites, and Jebusites. Yebus Right? All of them also live in Canaan. These are the nations that we literally have to go in and get them out. Okay? Now, based on that, we continue now the story. This was over, over how many thousand years ago? This is already now going back, oh, at least, what, 5,000 years ago? Give and take? 1948. What? Flood of 1948. So yeah, right. <laughs> So 1948. Okay, so now, with that being said, 
We got Abraham. He's got a mission. He makes the covenant. God's going to give you the land. He's already quoted. I've already quoted him several times. God telling Abraham, the land's for you. The land's for you. The land's for you. Fine. Now, look at this. This is such an important concept because people are going to ask about this. And I want to, it's amazing that we're discussing because people don't talk about this. Okay. Take a look at the go. Let's go back to Breshit Bara Elohim at the Shemaim Da'ar. It's the first possible. God created heaven and earth. Okay. Look at this. Look at the second pasuk. This is very important. The Aaretz Haita Tohu Bebohu. The earth was unformed and void. The Choshech Apnei Tehom, and there was darkness over the surface of the deep. Beruach Elokim Erachevet Apnei Amayim, and a wind from God sweeping over the water. Pasuk two pasuks later, it says, Vayomer Elokim Yehi Or Vayi Or, and God says, "There's going to be light," and there was light. So this is brought in one of the commentaries, unbelievable. And he's, they said like this, just like there's this concept of Rashi Bara Lakim, which represents Israel as well, as I we spoke about in the beginning of the class, just like there was this concept of unformed and void, same way like creation, Eretz Israel had to come out through this concept of Tohu Bebohu, this concept of unformed, not, not, not has no holiness at all. And this is the concept that the Kabbalists talk about. They describe this concept of klipot. Does everybody know what a klipa is? Okay. Well, they talk about it like this. You have a fruit, right? You have a nice apple, so to speak. And it's got a peel around the apple. So the idea would be that inside of this fruit is the spirituality. And the peel, the outside, is covering the spirituality. So you know, in order for you to get into the spirituality, you got to remove the peel. You got to remove the klipot that completely surrounds and conceals the godliness that's inside. So what were the Canaanites? What were these nations? But specifically, as we're going to learn about, these Canaanite people that were living in Canaan. They were literally that peel. They're covering the holiness completely. Take a look at this. We have proof now talking about how bad and immoral and bad the Canaanites were to show you how much klipa these people are. Take a look at this. Sorry for you guys here. Let me put you guys on the screen. I'm sorry. Here we go. We know the Noah who was a big tzaddik, he taught his children that they worship Hashem, right? Now, the Canaanites, what did they do from Ham? They worshiped idols. They didn't worship Hashem, right? Sorry? Yes. Yes. The chosen Am Segula technically means the, the chosen. Uh, what is called the, the people of the three points? I don't know what the three points are. Oh. I don't know what that is. No, because here I'm not seeing the because of what we're doing courses. It says that you have to keep three points to create uh like the balance in between all. Is that from what where are you getting that from exactly? Um, okay. Let's talk about that after class. I like I'm already interested in where you're getting it from. Um, okay, so now look at some circum so discussing, just so you know how bad Canaan is, right? Hashem is telling right now the Jewish people before they're getting into Eretz Israel, don't copy the practices of the land of Egypt where you were at, or of the land of Canaan, of all those Canaanites, to which I'm going to take you. Don't follow the laws. Off the bat, God's telling you, not good people, right? What does that mean? Look at what Rashi says. Rashi explains that the verse about these Egyptian practices, which were considered among the worst of the generation, you know how bad it was in Egypt in regards to a Zara about worshiping idols. The Canaanites were even worse than the Egyptians. Okay, that's what the Ramban says. Canaan, the Canaanites represent the most hostile klipot. 
that they had to be removed. In order for them to be removed, then the Kedusha can be actually shown. Canaanites did a tremendous amount of immorality. Immorality, which means relations with animals, relations man on man, relations and, uh, you know, with another wife. Anything you can think of, Canaan represented immorality, right? So we see that what is immorality equal, right? Immorality is considered not only terrible, but it's concept also of arrogance. Arrogance means I can do whatever I want. That's what immorality does, and that's what immorality means. So what is, why is that important in regards to the whole print of things? Because if you keep looking at all the psukim, take a look at this. That's what you're not, you should not do to them. Break down their altars, shatter their sacred pillars, cut them. You got to do all these things to these people. Get them out. You have to burn their statutes in fire. You have to destroy all their car stones and wash their multi images in high places. These are bad, bad people that were the worst of the worst, the klipa of the klipa. We even see, this is really amazing, because if you start looking at the psukim, you follow along. You're like, you, never, you don't catch on to these things when you're looking at the regular script. Take a look at this. Abraham warns Eliezer. Abraham goes, I need to find a shidduch. I need to find a, a, a wife for my son, Itzhak. What does he tell Eliezer? Don't take a wife for Isaac from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I, I'm in land, and I live in Canaan. Please don't take a wife from these people. Okay? Pointing out, again, how bad they are. And we see with Itzhak and his son, Yaakov. He sent Yaakov away from the land of Canaan to go find himself a wife. Don't look at the people of Canaan, right? Take a look at this. Canaan, you can see here, Canaan, has the word within Canaan in Hebrew, I put it in, in English for easy pur purpose, has the word chachna. Canaan has the word chachna, kuf nun ein nun. What does Eretz Yisrael represent? Represent humility nothingness. You know, when you get to Eretz Yisrael, you learn a little bit about being humble. It humbles you, right? That's why a lot of people also have like a fear to get there and be there. Because now you have to give up. I have to give up. I have to give up for my physical. It's not as nice. I have my big house. I have my cars. No, like in Israel, it's like, whoops. Yes, that's right. Very good. So, so you see that Israel represents humility. You want to gain from the land of Eretz Yisrael? You want to feel the Kedusha and the holiness? Humble yourself in this land. Okay? Don't walk in there thinking that you're going to take over this town. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. That's not Eretz Yisrael. And if you do, by the way, what happens? The land will spit you out. Now, what does that mean, the land's going to spit you out? It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to literally spit you out. It means on a, on a physical level, there are many people that literally get physically spit out. They, they can't even be in the land of Israel anymore. They're out. They go back to America, back to another country. They can't even be there anymore. There are other people that are living in the land of Israel, but feel no connection to the land. There's nothing. Nada. Like many, many people today. Unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. So again, Canaan represents the opposite of humility. Canaan represents arrogance. I can do whatever I want. Immorality, idol worship. It's all about me. So we needed to figure out a way. In the Gemara, you can see here, Masechet Sota, adultery and idolatry equals arrogance. That's from the Gemara. Take a look at this amazing, amazing thing. Rav Nassim of Breslov. Rav Nassim of Breslov says something amazing about this concept of removing klipa. Let's read it together. There's a general rule that one first encounters the skin or the peel before one finds the fruit within. So too, there had to be klipot which concealed the Holy Land prior to its revelation. We know that a person has to choose good and when you have, you have to choose between good and evil, in order for you to choose good, there has to be evil. There's got to be bad. And that's how it is today in regards to free will, right? How do you, how does a person serve Hashem? Hashem gives you a lot of tests, a lot of question marks about life. 
how why, why is this happening? Why is that guy bad? There has to be good and there has to be evil. In order for you to get good, right? You have to learn how to get through, break through these evil forces. <clears throat> now, when these forces are not subdued, when when these forces are not calmed down, they're gonna say. What does that mean? The land is ours, the Arabs. The land is ours. You have no right to it. But once the person goes back to the concept of emuna and faith in Hashem, when you reveal the godliness, when I'm going on social media telling you how much holiness there is in Eretz Yisrael, I'm not doing it for kicks. I'm trying to show you the godliness within that place. And you recognize and experience the vitality of Torah that sustains them, then he can reply. Once it's so immersed in spirituality in Israel, but God took it from you and he gave it to me. That's that first puzzle except from Breshid. And this is an important concept with spirituality as well. Whenever a person is struggling and you're suffering through something, if he endeavors to find God in his spiritual search, then he will attain the strength of the concealed Torah. That's what Rav Nelson says. I'll explain what that means. And he's empowered to reply that the Klippot have no more power over him. It's the Torah and its vitality which give him that strength then the person reveals the sanctity of the Holy Land. When a person is filled with obstacles that are coming your way, challenges that are coming to you in life, if you don't immerse yourself completely in Hashem, completely confiding in Him, speaking to Him every single day, learning Torah, immersing yourself completely in spirituality, and pushing through the blockages and the challenges that are coming to that person, right? <laughs> a person cannot... Not only not, if you do that, you're going to only break through, you can break through the challenges. And if that strength, that koyach, that energy that a person is going to get, you now have a new, let's call it a new goggle, Google eyes that a person can have, that you can actually see a muna, the spirituality of Eretz Yisrael. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Meaning that if a person is going through challenges right now in life, and you can know how to immerse yourself all in and with Hashem, you go to Eretz Yisrael, you have new eyes. You feel and you can sense things that other people can't. Which is amazing. That's from Likutei Chalakot from Rav Nassan of So what happens from there? Let's continue on with the story. So God goes, look, I'm going to give you a land that you can serve me better in. Right? <clears throat> what happens with Abraham? We see after that whole story, Abraham says he goes to the land, but he didn't really go to the land. He was still there for five years before. <clears throat> and then, I told you before, he couldn't figure out what land is Hashem talking about. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to sense it. I'm not getting there. I don't understand it. Look at this. This is another huge chidush for a lot of people. And, I, and I'm going to stress this to everybody else. Take this and run with it to the best of your ability. Look what he says. He couldn't perceive the holiness. So what did he do? It says in the Pasuk, then he went to a city called Haran. And what did he do in Haran? Abraham says it, he took with him the souls that they made in Haran. Do you know what, that, what the souls that he made? What do you mean? How many kids did he have? The souls that he made in Haran, as we know specifically, Abraham was the master in helping people convert to belief in Hashem. Abraham is the first person to help people that were non-believers and made them believers. Say it again. Sarah too. I want to, of course, the Rebbe said she's probably more important than Abraham. She's the one putting him in his place. So <laughs> she's yeah, she's she's amazing also, of course. So, but Abraham and Sarah, right, were the ones that helped convert people from idol worship to faith in Hashem. What, by him being this great Sadiq who spread the belief of God everywhere, what was his reward? God goes, now I'm going to show you the land of Eretz Yisrael. He had to get all these people, these converts, bring them all into belief in Hashem. At that point, God goes, now you're ready to see the land. What does that mean? Number one, as you can, we'll talk about it later. A person who can help people come close to Hashem, Hashem gives them eyes, again, to sense the holiness and the Kedusha of the land of Eretz Yisrael. Just like Abraham did it, and we find out throughout wow. all the generations, all the tzaddikim, all the high-level individual righteous people who have helped so many people get close to Hashem, 
when you are tapping into that world, you're also tapping into the holiness of Eretz Yisrael, which means that you can feel it, you can sense it, and you can give it off, which means why? Well, Michael, I don't teach a class. I don't care. Share classes, help another person, help another, whatever it takes in Kiruv and bringing people close to God. There's so many different ways to doing it, whether it's financially bringing another person, creating a class in your house, whatever it takes. These are real mechanisms that can help. We learn that from Abraham and Sarah. Fine. Abraham is now 99 years old. What does he say? Mitzvah circumcision. <clears throat> and again, he promises him again. Another promise. Guard my covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. I'm going to give you and your descendants the land. You dwell in all the land of Canaan for an eternal heritage. Again, right? Now. Take a look at this. I spoke to you before I said to you that Abraham got new eyes because he brought all these people from Haran and he brought them close. Look at this, guys. Amazing. We find out, unfortunately, right, at some point, Sarah Imenu passes away. Okay? And now she needs to be buried. Where is she going to be buried? Abraham sees and he goes and look at the story here. He has to go buy a, buy a plot for her, right? And he goes to Mr. Ephron. Ephron, who was living, who owned this cave of Machpelah. What does the Zohar say on this? Look at this, guys. <clears throat> he says as follows. When Abraham ran into the herd and he fetched the calf to bring to his guests, the calf ran into the cave of Machpelah. Abraham pursued it. He ran after it. And he found the cave filled with beautiful aromas and amazing light. It was and still is the gateway to the Garden of Eden. By the way, for those that don't know, Baruch Hashem, after 120 years, when a person passes away, your soul leaves, goes a little trip, and in order for you to go into the next world, you literally go through Maracha Machpel. That's the, that's the connection level to the next world. Okay? That's why it's such a holy place. Adam and Eve are buried there. We spoke about this. All the different of Avos are being buried there. That's what I said, Adam and Eve. Yeah. So this is the gateway to the to Garden of Eden, is the Maracha Machpela. So it says, the Zohar says, Ephron was disgusted by the dark cave. He cared less. I have his nice... Ah. And when Abraham goes in there, he's like, wow. Oh my God. This is amazing. Right? Abraham goes, what does he do? He purchases the land. He purchases it. And of course, Ephron said, yeah, Abraham paid him big, big money. He saw the value in it, right? Gave him big money. Abraham was shown, this is what the Zohar says, Abraham was shown what was his. Ephron, what was his? Ephron's portion was darkness. Abraham was, was light and splendor, which means that the sanctity, the holiness of the Holy Land is revealed when God is revealed to him. Meaning, this is all from the Zohar. When a tzaddik teaches others about spirituality, this is what he did, he attained such a high level of recognition of Hashem that the holiness of the land was revealed only to him. Now, he tried to spread those teachings to the people, okay, and it spread to an, a, a moment, but it didn't, it didn't, let's say, catch on to the level what Abraham had acquired. But this comes to show you that he brought all the people from Quran, God opened up his eyes, Time to now bury my wife. He, bring, he buys the cave of Machpelah. He's like, this is literally the most holiest place ever. <laughs> and, and Ephraim's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he owned that land. You would assume, okay, it's like I might, I might have a little bit of uh, connection. To, he could care less. <laughs> okay. Because he's the Klippa. There he is. There. How are you learning? Okay, good. Next. So now, with that being said, <laughs> <clears throat> now, another interesting teaching from that is like this. And this is another concept of Eretz Yisrael. We're speaking about humility. Ephron, look at the name Ephron. Ephron is spelled Ayin, Fe, Resh, Vav, Nun. What's the root word of Ephron? Afar. Afar means earth, right? Earth represents also the concept of mat material materiality. 
material existence. I'm more interested in the material world. I'm going to go to Eretz Israel, get my penthouse in Tel Aviv. Again, I'm just talking out loud here, but I'm just making a point to you. I got to make sure I've got the nice car. Like, you're not in it for the spirituality. I'm not here to get close to Hashem on the highest level and, and do so much to do in Eretz Yisrael in regards to Kedusha and Holiness. That was Ephron. I got my big cave over here. Like, he had a lot of money. He care less. And we see that, as it was, we know, Rabbi Nachman brings this down. There's three main things that, that take away a person from Hashem and spirituality. The three things that take away from Hashem is gluttony, food, takes you away from Hashem, sexual desires, and money. These are the three things that take you away from Hashem. And this is exactly what we're talking about just alone on the concept of materialism. Now, we go further in the story. I'm going to try to go a little quicker here. We have Itzchak, right? God promises him the land. He gives for you and your seed. Again, God's making the promises. He's continuing. Itzchak, you're going to have this land. And I'm going to fulfill the same one that I promised Abraham. But what happened? And so we learned something very interesting. We spoke about the Klippas. Right, we see that specifically, even though Abraham had access to the land in regards to spirituality, he still had to live in a way of materialism too. He had to buy that cave for a lot of money. It wasn't like just give it to him, even though the land was for him. He still had to go through nature to get that what he needed. It's Huck the same thing. It's Huck gets there, and the Philistines that are there are giving him a hard time. <clears throat> They're fighting over the land. You have your sheep, I have my sheep. They're giving him problems. It's not like 100%. Even though Itzhak was helping people and trying to make car and bringing them close, it, it, it still wasn't ready yet. That land wasn't ready 100% yet for, the, for them, for the Jewish people. <clears throat> so then what happens? Then we get to Yaakov. Now again, we got Isaac. God is promising Abraham. He promised Isaac. Now we're at Yaakov. Here we go. I put it here in, in, in beautiful in Hebrew. So God is standing beside him, besides Yaakov. He's coming to him, obviously, in a vision. And he says, I am Hashem, the God of your father, Abraham's, of the Haram's house, and the God of Isaac's house. And he's telling Yaakov, the ground where you're lying on, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to give it to your offspring. You can see, again, another Here's a promise from Hashem coming down to Yaakov now. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we see here again, same story with Yaakov. Yaakov gets to Shechem, and on his return from the house of Laban, which he was given a hard time, right? And he also spread teachings, but he also was never like, here's the land, Yaakov, go, take over. No. On the contrary, there's a famine. Now they don't know what to do. Now the, 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 the brothers have to go to Egypt to go get grainy. Like, it's still not theirs. We don't 100% own the place. Even though, ironically, we know later on that Yaakov Avinu really was the starting point. Because, as we know, Israel is called Eretz Israel, right? Which is, Israel is Yaakov. It's the same person, right? So we see here, though, very, very, very interesting thing is that Yaakov had the 12 sons. And those 12 sons continued on the tradition. Remember, Abraham had Ishmael. That didn't work out, let's say, so well in the sense that Ishmael, right, was not going to be the continuation of the descendants, right? And then Itzhak has Esav. And that also didn't work out very well. Esav also went off the beaten path. And he also didn't follow along. And now you have Yaakov and his 12 sons were legit following the path of Hashem. To the extent that when Yaakov is passing away, what, what's the ultimate affirmation of Emunah and faith? Remember, Emunah and faith is connected with the land of Eretz Yisrael. Yaakov says to them, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And what do they respond back? Baruch Shem Kevor Machuto Le'olam Va'ed. The ultimate expression of Emunah and faith is that Pasuk. These 12 sons were amazing. They're perfect. By the way, just to give you an idea how amazing things you can do right now in Eretz Yisrael that I just found out there and I didn't get a chance. I hope sometime too, soon I will. There's people that I know now that are going into where Joseph was uh, thrown, the famous story where Joseph was thrown into a ditch, into a pit. 
The area is called Dotam. Dotam. There are now people that are taking army trucks, and you can literally go specifically. The Arabs don't change the names of the areas. They change them by like the, their verbiage, but they, the original, original names from the Bible, they're all still there. Dotam is still there. They went there. I've seen videos. They have a place in Dotam. They had the three main big ditches, huge ditches, the same place where Yosef was put in. How amazing is that? Amazing. Bashem. Near that area. So you have to take the army trucks and, and the helicopters. <laughs> yeah. So, so there you go. So that's amazing. That's a new thing that people can kind of do. Anyways, fine. Now look at this. This is unbelievable. Emuna, emuna, emuna. Faith, faith, faith. Equals what? Eretz Yisrael. What happens? Yaakov, there's a famine in the land. What happened? Look at this because it's so important. They're supposed to take it over the land. There's a concept of trust and emuna. What happens? No trust, no emuna. Let's go try to get grain from Egypt. Okay, let's see what happens. And that sets up the whole thing with Yosef and the whole story. What happened? Let's go back even earlier. When Avram Avinu, yeah, when God tells Avram Avinu, hey, Avram, by the way, I want you to know that I'm going to give you this land. So what does Avram Avinu say? Avram Avinu responds to Hashem. Vayom Hashem, Hashem, ki Hashirena. How am I going to know that I'm going to get this land? God goes, you're going to get this land. Abraham goes, but how am I going to know that I'm going to get this land? That question, like, I don't trust. I don't, tr again, this is important because it's such a big, it's such a big, um, if I have to tell you what tonight's class is, it's Emuna in, 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 in Israel. I don't trust. God tells me to do, this is what's going to happen. I'm like, but how is it going to happen? By him asking the question, you know what happened? You know, look at the next person. Now, because of that, you have to know that your children are going to be in Egypt for 400 years. His lack of emuna, by that asking that question, led to the whole story of the Jewish people having to get into, the, into Egypt for 400 years. That's what it's brought down in the commentaries. Lack of emuna. Yes. Many times, but this is the, the, the original, original comes from Abraham Avinu's that question. That's what set it all off. Now, I think that's amazing. First of all. I just think that's a, it's a big thing. And what does it mean now that I'm going into Egypt? Egypt is the opposite of Eretz Israel. Egypt is the land of idolatry, right? It's a land of immorality, right? Yeah. Did, are we too skipping much. around because you have this line that you said that it said before, don't do what you did in Egypt. Started by Seth. Ask the question again. Didn't we start before by saying that what God said to him, or it said, don't do what you did in Egypt? No, that's what he, that's what God told the Jewish people in the desert. Beginning. In the desert. Yeah, we're, 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 we're hopping back and forth a little bit. But I'm, I'm going through the storyline. You know, we're just going through a storyline right now. We're, we're now, now we're going to Egypt. Okay? But then all the lands that were inside of it still there? They were there. They're, they were there before. They're there right now. They're hanging out. They're still there. Not yet. We're not there yet. Slow down. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. No problem. We're almost there. Fine. So now, here's again something very important. Lack of, again, lack of emuna. What happens? Now you're going to go to Egypt. Now look at this. <laughs> oh my goodness, guys. I'm so sorry online. I'm not, you guys are not following along with me at all. Okay, fine. Now, take a look at this. God says to Abraham, you should know that your offspring, this is, the, this is what he told him after he said, how am I going to know? Know well that your offspring, this is important because I underlined it, your offspring shall be strangers in the land, not theirs. Okay, so now we know that the land that's supposed to belong to us is still Israel. Okay, it's important because you look at these words and you're like, just take it for, it's not their land. So they're going to Egypt. They're going to be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. 
and I'm going to execute judgment on that nation. I'm going to, I'm going to beat down on Egypt eventually. And they're going to be free and they're going to have a lot of money. And they're going to be leaving with a lot of wealth. And they shall return here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That's the puzzle from Hashem to Abram. Now, what happens? We see, first of all, Ishmael and Esav, who are descendants of Abraham Avinu, they didn't endure slavery in Egypt. Why am I saying that? Because again, we're, we're talking about validating that the Jewish people have access to Eretz Yisrael. It's their land. How many times have I been telling you? It's going to your descendants. It's going to your descendants. It's going to your descendants. And here you're seeing in this Pasuk, specifically saying, your offspring are going to be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Who's his offspring? Well, it could also be Esau, and it could also be Ishmael, but they didn't do slavery. Because that's not what Hashem wanted. What is the, the, the point of the matter, that, what is it, to show you that the lineage goes has to be going directly from Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, 12 sons. Like, that is the mechanism based upon the Pesukim. It's very clear. And it's showing you that they don't have that. that that's not their thing. Right? It's important because, again, when you're asking about Emuna and faith in the land, I just go back to that first bus, like I said, it's like, they can claim, well, I have that land and it's my land. I'm like, really? It's your land? Let's go through Let's go through the story because that's what we're doing right now. So, it's a direct line is what you're saying. Yeah. You say specifically, your offspring is talking about that. Also. Yeah, the condition it says here. Look, I have it written here. The, the period of slavery is a precondition for receiving the promised land. That's part of the deal. You're gonna get the land, but you gotta go through. You gotta go through slavery first. Okay. Now, and I think it's interesting again because they went down to Egypt, and Egypt represents the opposite of Emuna. They went down to Egypt. That's what Rabbi Nachman says. It's the opposite. Now, what happens next? <clears throat> we see. Something very interesting. Now the Jewish people, Bnei Israel, is in Egypt. What happened? At some point, they lost their faith. They lost their munah. They're down and out. They're down and out. No more. They're not in Eretz Israel. They're down and out in Egypt. Okay? So we see that what happens from there, they get into idolatry, right? The Jewish people got into idolatry immorality also they forgot about hashem what does that mean again in for a lesson for all of us you could see that the moment that you pull out of is the big difference between being an eretz israel even though there's a lot of things that we could talk about right now in eretz israel that are not perfect yeah but you could see that there is a level of super high level of kedusha and holiness that's there the moment you pull out and you're out you're gonna feel a drop there's a massive drop egypt could be United States. Why? Because there's a concept of assimilation. The same way that the Jewish people in every single exile, wherever they went, this is my place. Egypt is my home. Yeah? And I'm, I'm in slavery, which means what? I am away from Hashem. I'm completely out of Emunah mode. I'm in the world of the secular life. Right? It's that same concept. We're slaves to society. You're slaves to your phone. You're slaves to social media. You're slaves. I've had news for you. You're slaves to work. It's the same concept, but it's it's. it's I'm trying to show, show it to you as like a, as a how do you call it? Like a, as an example, so to speak, of how how this applies to everyday life. So boom, they're in slavery. What happened? Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. They cried out to God. It was really, really bad. I would hope that sometime, at some point in someone's life, when they're so down and out. And away from Hashem, there's a moment where, like, all I got is Hashem. And there's a cry. A cry from within, where are you, Hashem? And it comes. That's the best, because that's a wake-up call. Yeah? So at that point, that's what happened with the Jewish people. They cried out. Hashem hears the prayers, and look at the Pasuk. He recalls the covenant with Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Then we got Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses comes into the scene, Right? God brings him in front of the, God brings him in, he's talking to him, and he says what? He says to him, I heard the suffering of my people. I will deliver them from Egypt. I'm going to bring them to a good and spacious land. God goes back, I'm going to give him that land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
as a sign that you're going to redeem the people from Egypt and you will serve God on this mountain. So what happens? We see Moshe's like, oh, God, I don't want to do the mission. He's fighting with God. I don't want to do this. What is one of the things that Moshe Rabbeinu says? But the people are not going to believe me. Believe, emunah. The people are not going to believe me. They have no emunah. Right? Look at Moshe of Bayomer. They're not going to, Yaminu is from the root word emunah. Not gonna believe me. They're not gonna listen to me. They're gonna say, so what does Hashem say? Hashem is like looking at me like, are you kidding me? Like, come on, you're gonna keep arguing with me? So what does Hashem respond back to him? The wording is, and I just cut out the main part. It says, Leman Ya'aminu ki nira alecha Hashem, elokei Abotam, elokei Abraham, elokei Yitzchak, elokei Yaakov. There's a, Hashem says in the Pasuk, and he says that they may believe that Hashem, again, emu, ya aminu, emuna, they're going to believe that Hashem, who is the God of their ancestors, the God of Avraham, Itzhak, and Yaakov. Who do these three represent? Concept of emuna, the tzaddik, faith, etc. So now the Jewish people, we're back, baby. We're back with emuna, we're back with faith. We're ready now. They believe in Moses. It's going to happen. Let's go. We're ready to go to Israel now because we have emuna. Right? Then what happens after that? We see, number one, a very, very important thing. They had to now, they're leaving Egypt. What is the first commandment they got to do when they're getting out of Egypt? They have to do the Korban Pesach. In order for you to have that Korban Pesach, we're about to leave Egypt. What do you got to do? Circumcision. Cut. Chop, chop. <laughs> But they have to do the Brit. What is a Brit? Because in order for you to get to the land of Israel, the same way that Abraham Avinu had that covenant, you got to do the same thing. You got to do something that is out of bounds, not normal. You're not a baby. You're an adult, and you're going to get a Brit. Does that not show emuna or what? I don't know what else does, right? But it's a point. It's a real, real thing. Why are you doing that right now? Because in order for you to get in, by the way, the trip was supposed to be much quicker. Okay, then it wasn't supposed to last 40 years. It was supposed to be a nice trip to Eretz Yisrael. We're done. Fine. But it's important because I wanted to bring that out, that they had to get circumcised beforehand. What? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, guys. Sorry, guys. All right. Oh, my God. I'm so up. Okay, here we go. Now, this is real. Now, I'm going to tell you something so cool. It's so real. Rabbi Nachman talks about it. But it's so amazing because people, again, don't think about these things. The Gemara says there's three specific things that a person has to struggle in life. You struggle to get them. What are the three things? Torah learning, Olam Haba, and Eretz Yisrael. These are the three things. What do we learn? That the Jewish people... In order to, for them to get Eretz Yisrael and attain Eretz Yisrael as a, as a predecessor for us, because we are the DNA, we're the continuation. Whatever happens to them happens to us. The same way that they had to struggle to get into Eretz Yisrael, guess what? That's still a struggle for many people today. For his, all history. But even more so, I want that. I mean, I'm, and I'm reaching out to all you people that are here on social media too. A lot of people struggle with this. Let's first, let's talk about what happened with the Jewish people in the desert, right? Things that happen. Now, there's many things that happen, but let's, basic struggles. You have Miriam, the prophet, who passes away. What happens when she passes away? No more water. That sucks when you're in the desert. But I'm just <laughs> No more water. Next, the Jewish people want to get to the land of Edom, to the south. If they go through Edom, boom, directly to Eretz Yisrael. Easy pathway. What do they say? Uh-uh, you're not coming in. Sorry. What happens? Let's take a whole detour all the way around. Now, you know what it's like in traffic when it sucks and you're like trying to get somewhere and it's really annoying and it's not a good feeling and you're like, oh my God, and now I'm late. And nah, nah, nah. This is the same thing, but much worse that you're walking in the desert, right? Fine. They go all the way around. Then what happens next? I'm going in a can order. Aharon dies. Ay, ay, ay. Aharon the Cohen dies. What was Aharon's also gift? The clouds of glory. 
there was clouds that were covering the Jewish people at all times, it gave them nice weather, their clothes was being washed. It was like a miraculous, beautiful. He passes away. What happens when the clouds are gone? Israel is exposed. Expose, get ready, they're going to get attacked. Who attacks them? Amalek. From where? From behind. Yeah? Goes after the, 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 the weak, the weak people. Amalek is a whole representation today regarding spirituality, what it represents, not for this class, but boom, they get attacked. Fine. Eventually, they beat Amalek. Moshe has the whole battle with his hands up in the air, right? It's a whole big scene. And Baruch Hashem, the Jewish people beat Amalek. The whole war that they had to deal with. Next, you have Sichon and Og. Sichon and Og were like these massive giants, leaders. People were scared of them. People paid them a lot of money for protection in all the areas around Eretz Yisrael, okay? Same thing with them. Um, Mr. Sichon and Og, can we get through your territory? We just want to get to Eretz Yisrael. Sorry, dude, you're not getting through here. What happens? Got to go to war. They go to war. People are freaking out. The description in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible is very clear. They were freaking out that they had to go to war against Sichon and Og. There's like, no way we're going to win. What happens? With Moshe Rabbeinu, big time emunah, emunah, faith, they win. And they kill Sichon and Og and their armies, which was like a huge thing. And everybody surrounding them were like, oh my God, like that's legit. These people are real. They didn't kill Og. What? They didn't kill Og. They didn't kill Og. That's not true. Moshe killed them. Moshe killed them. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he killed them later. He killed them. Now, what's next? Then you have the Moabites. We just passed the Parsha, Parsha Balak. We just did it right now. He hires Bilam. Bilam has to now curse them. What about Hashem? God protects the Jewish people. He's unsuccessful. What happens next? No problem. I know how to get those Jewish guys. Let's get the Midianite women to go get them and seduce them. When the Midian women come out, they seduce all the Jewish people. A lot of people died. A lot. Of, how many? 24,000 24, people died. It's a lot of people dying for having relations with Midian women. That's not a lot of fun. I can imagine how much difficulty and challenges, families losing people. It's hard. Okay? You see all these struggles? You see that? Rabbi Nachman brings this out. It's a beautiful thing. He says that all of the obstacles that the Jewish people on the way to Holy Land had to deal with are the same struggles that a person has to go through. Israel represents spirituality. When a person is growing and getting closer to Hashem, some people are in level one, some people are level 10. But every time you want to go up in levels, there's always going to be pushback. That's a big thing in spirituality. People don't realize that when you know it, okay, I'm in the game. You have to know you're in the game. I have my uniform on and I'm going to play. But that means it doesn't always mean it. Spirituality is always going to come easy. You're going to get blockages. You're going to get challenges. Whatever level that you're at, you have to know you have to be prepared. You have to know these things are coming at you. Israel represents that. Israel represents spirituality. And the same way the Jewish people have to go through challenges and struggles to get there, it's the same for us. It's a learning lesson. But at the same time, it's also a real lesson to get to Eretz Israel. I can tell you right now that when I just went to Israel, literally, you can't make this stuff up. I'm like prepared, ready to go. And the day, I would say like the day, the day before I was leaving, all of a sudden, I'm starting to feel super headachy, and I heard that that somebody else and uh, somebody else had maybe had had a COVID. Da da da. By the next morning, I'm literally leaving on a flight, and I feel horrible, Ho horrible. And I'm like, oh, I know this lesson. <laughs> I ah miniot. You're already taking the next paragraph from me. It's coming. It's coming. You're going. We got some. We got some Rabbi Nachman fans here. All right. So, so, but, 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 but the real, but the reality is, I saw it. It was difficult. I felt so not good, and I'm like, I'm like, I took almost every single drug possible in the sense to try to make myself feel better, including taking stuff that even if I know it wasn't COVID or not COVID, some of the stuff I was taking to like just mask. Anything, anything I can do to like, but 
literally for the next two days, even when I got to Israel there for a day and a half, I really was not feeling well, but I was very conscious of these lessons. I knew that this was, if this was happening, I'm like, it's, it's going to be worth it, but I have to earn my keep. Yeah. So Baruch Hashem, thank God. Once I was there, two days later, after that, it felt good. I had another issue that happened to me in Israel too, which I don't want to talk about. But the point of the matter is that the obstacles still were there. It's real. It's real. So Rabbi Nachman says, based on that, it's a beautiful idea that once you can overcome the meniot, meniot means challenges. Once you can overcome the meniot, they can turn into ne'imot. Ne'imot is the concept of pleasantness, meaning once a person overcomes a difficult challenge in your life and you've, so to speak, stood on top of that mountain, it feels amazing. Because you know that you worked hard on it. You knew that this was coming your way. And 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 it, and especially when it comes to Shabbat, it's a great feeling because at the end of the day, all of it was because you just wanted to get close to Hashem. Right? Rabbi Nathan says, the impediments and the obstacles that the Israelites encountered during their journey to the promised land increased their longing to reach their destination and their courage in battle, which later enabled them to gain greater benefits of the land. Now, what I want to say to you is like this. This is a big thing, which we'll talk about more in next week's class. Yearning. Do you know what yearning means? How do you say in Spanish yearning? Desire. Desear. Desear. Desire. 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 I like the words. I want to say it in Spanish also because it's such a big statement that people don't even realize it. Desead, desire, ratzon, will. It's the highest. In the world of Sefirot, in the Kabbalah, Keter is the top. The Keter is the crown. Okay? And the light from the, that is the highest light possible from Hashem. The Kabbalists bring down and say that the Keter, which is all the way in the top, what is connected to the light of Keter? Ratzon, desire, will, I want, I want to be close to you. I want to get to Eretz Yisrael. I want to wake up early in the morning to do Tikkun Hatzot. I want, and I want, and I want. For Hashem, you know, you want, that's amazing. That light is everything. The blockages, the pre things that prevent you, you know what it does? I want. You know when you can't get that girl? I want. Right? What you want, you want what you can't have. Talking for the single guys out there. I, I, you, I want what I can't have. When it comes to I want what I can't have for spirituality, for Hashem, the highest, to the extent that even to the extent that if a person, let's say they're on their way to Davin Mincha with the minion, and you're doing it and you're trying, and then there's traffic, and then, and next thing you know, like I'm stuck in traffic, I couldn't make it to the minion. You know what the, the, the what it says? It's as if you made the minion. Why? But I didn't make the minion. No, I don't care. Ratzon. I want my desires there. God goes, it's as if you did it. Even if I want to think about it, I'll let it pass. Thinking about it, thinking about it also. Yes, it's, a, it's connected to Ratzon. Yes. So with that being said, I wanted to read that list, last paragraph to you. Which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a very famous thing that Rabbi Nachman said. It's like a few guys here online. Sorry, i way behind. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm so behind. <laughs> I'm so in trouble. Okay, guys, by the way, for those that are online, I'll send you guys the PDF on the WhatsApp group. For those that want to join the, fat, the WhatsApp group, please make sure to stick around and talk to Eliora. She'll get you in the WhatsApp group. I'm going to put this PDF, the whole class will be on it. So you guys can take it home and, and look it over all, with all the, all, everything on it. Look what Rabbi Nachman says. This is from Likutei Maharan, chapter 20. He also brings this down in Sikhot Haran, and I mean Rabbi Nachman's wisdom. And he says like this. It's the last, last paragraph in this whole thing. <clears throat> Rabbi Nachman goes through this whole lesson. And he says like this. When one comes to Eretz Yisrael, he's called a mighty warrior. In the beginning of the lesson, Rabbi Nachman said, whoever wants to be a Jew, what does a Jew mean? A person who's going from level to level. 
What does that mean? A person who's striving to constantly grow and get closer to Hashem. We live as Jews. Our job is not to be stagnant. And we definitely don't want to go down. Although going down, not because you want it to happen, but sometimes because God makes it happen is also okay. Because the down is for you to go on a higher level. By the way, it's a very important lesson in spirituality. And it's actually important that I repeat it again. Sometimes we're in spirituality and you're like this and you're going up. This is one of Rabbi Nachman's most famous lessons. You're going up, 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 up. I'm feeling so close to Hashem. I'm doing this. I'm doing all these mitzvahs. Ah, and you're on fire. And it's great. Rabbi Nachman says, when you're like that, go. Push, 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 push. But then sometimes God goes, I guess, yeah, yeah. And God goes, oh yeah, bye. Boom. And he pushes you off the cliff. And now he goes, now I'm not here anymore. Find me. And that could be led into different scenarios in life where you're like, where are you? Oh my God. And, and, and I'm not even, I'm, I don't want to learn. Or I, I, I feel like I'm so lost. That point, Rabbi Nachman says, when you're there, first of all, you have to know Hashem is right there with you. That's number one. Two, he says, you have to have patience. Wait. Wait. Chill out wait because it's like a boomerang effect but once you go up here and then you go down this was the up you go down here sorry for you guys on the screen you're up here you go down when you go down and you're waiting you're waiting to ascend to go like a boomerang you go boom boom and you go a little higher now level two that's a very important lesson in spirituality so never think that oh Ah, I'm not connected anymore. Yeah, it's over. I'm like, ah. It's all part of spirituality. It's how the game works. So sometimes you're going to feel low. You have to just wait. Keep doing the best that you can and doing what you were doing before. Don't give up. You're going to see that all of a sudden God will come back to you and you're going to you feel even higher. Very good. It's like this only. It's like a dice. Correct. So it says, so right. So it's talking about when you're looking at a person's, uh, what do you call it? The heart, the heart. Yeah. Oh, the rhythm. The rhythm. It should be like this. If you're like this, you're flat, like you're dead. It means you're not alive. You need to have ups. It has to come down. It ha like, some people think, oh, it's up, it's down. Oh, it's over, I'm down. Yeah, that's what you have to the way correct so rabbi nachman saying that a jew is a person who goes from level to level and you can by doing that you succeed how do you do that through the land of eretz israel when he wins the battle and he arrives in the holy land he's then called a mighty warrior a person who's able to make it to eretz israel but israel Hashem first to live there wow wow you're a warrior but even if it was just to get there, to take four steps, every step that you take in Eretz Yisrael is a mitzvah. Okay? Like Rabbi Nachman. It's another whole story. Then he says, look at this. Look at the last paragraph. Then Rabbi Nachman gave this lesson. He said, and Rab, so he's telling all this. And Rabbi Nachman, his main student, asked him, what did you mean when you said that the land of Israel is so great that this is the main victory of life? What does that even mean? So the Rebbe, the Rebbe Rabbeinu, answers and he says, I mean... This, Israel, with the houses and the apartments, what does that mean? He wanted every Jew who wished to be a true Jew just to go to Eretz Yisrael. And even if you encounter many difficulties, many great and seemingly insurmountable barriers, crazy blockages, you I can't even get there. You have to make every single effort to get there. And Rabbi Nachman from that, he talked about the tremendous amount of obstacles and dangers that he faced when he made the trip out to the Holy Land. We have a whole story about how Rabbi Nachman, he did whatever he did, had to do to get to Eretz Yisrael. The story is really, really, really long. You can find it in the book Tzadik. I'm talking about, you think, I, I mean, the amount of obstacles we're talking about, he had insane obstacles. And even when he was in Israel, he had insane obstacles. But all of that... The moment he got to Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Nachman, after making it, took him months to get there, he literally steps on the ground. And he goes, I think he literally took his four steps. He's like, okay, I'm ready to go back home now. 
I already downloaded the data. The data came into Rabbi Nachman as soon as he landed in Israel. He's like this. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, I'm ready to go now. I'm ready to write my second Likud Semohara book. Just by getting the, the energy from being there. His, his attendant was with him. He's like, dude, we just took two months to get there. You're not going back right now. And they ended up going through the land of Aries. Aries is well, great stories, etc. But the lesson that we have, and just a takeaway from today, we went through the history. We went into deep, deep meanings of really what was going on. How did we get to the land? And next week, we're going to talk a lot now, more in depth, Rabbi Nachman. This is more of like a historical slash ideas. But next week, we're going to talk a lot about how do you earn Eretz Yisrael? What do you do when you're there? What, what does it mean to have faith in Emunah? We're going to go so deep into this. Rabbi Nachman is probably the number one Hasidic master who speaks most about Eretz Yisrael than anybody else. And not by a little bit, by a lot of it. He's all day talking about Eretz Yisrael, nonstop. So as a as a as I we finish with the life of a Breslover, a Breslover Chassid, a person who falls in the path of Rabbi Nachman, Zat Hashem, we should all be Zoche to make it to Eretz Yisrael, whether it's to move to Eretz Yisrael, to, to visit Eretz Yisrael, and we should all see together the coming of Mashiach Bim Rabbi Amen.